everybody. We there we go. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing all right this very fine Monday morning of this, our last week of classes. Huzzah! I'm so happy. I'm just extremely ecstatic. Yes. Yes! Yes! All right. Enough for we have a certain amount of lecturing to do today. Um, but yeah, so, um, with respect to the all of the everything, I suppose it would be good to have a little bit of time this morning to check in with you guys. How are you guys doing? I see we have a whole 30 people today. Wow! That's, you know, out of 300, that's really good. Uh... <laughs> If you have any questions about the test, uh, by test I mean the examination. The final exam is on Thursday this week. We're having a review session at 9.30 a.m. Wednesday. Um, yep, that's, uh, that's, that's all that. Um, assignment 10, uh, the due date for it was uh, yesterday at midnight, there is, of course, the three-day grace period, which brings it right up to Monday, or right up to Wednesday, and then, like, the next day is the exam, so if I were you, I would have done it last week, uh, <laughs> but I understand that's not always possible. So, um, <clears throat> thank you. So, yeah, are there any questions about the exam? Are there any questions about the course? Are there any questions about anything? Oh! There's one thing I should talk to you about. There has been a development over the weekend uh, with respect to the uh, course evaluation uh, percentage um, thing. So the course evaluation percentage, I promised you guys certain things if you guys hit a certain percentage response rate on that. Um, so there's a reason that you can't view it on the uh, the big old list of uh, course evaluation response rates. Um, the reason for that is apparently, according to the collective bargaining agreement that's made between the university and CUPE, for some gosh darned reason, um, they don't show the courses with sessional professors. I don't know why. I don't know what's going on with that. I don't know why that would be a thing that would be requested by the union, because that seems to be a thing that's, you know, that the union would have had to specifically request. I'm not sure what the, what the deal is, but apparently I just have to email the people to get the, um, the course evaluation response rates, and I have done that, and as soon as this person responds to my email, I will put up a, uh, an announcement on Avenue updating you guys on what the response rate is so that, you know, everybody's, everybody's happy. The information is coming. Uh, so yeah, cool. So, uh, will SQL be tested on the exam? It is certainly testable. Um, whether or not it is actually on the exam will be left to you to find out on the day of the exam, but it is definitely in the category of things which I may very well put a test question on the exam about. Um, will we have 2.5 hours or a whole day? I am glad that you have asked this question. So according to the registrar, you have two and a half hours to write the exam. According to me, it's the same as the test. Same procedure as the test, exact same procedure as the test, 24-hour writing window. Of course, the reason we do the 24-hour writing window is to have some degree of accommodation for people who are all across the planet. You know, we have people taking this course in, like, um, India and China, and, you know, China itself, if you are if you live there, as some of you do, it's got, a, like, a 11, 12-hour difference between, um, you know, where I am in North America. That's why in old Bugs Bunny cartoons you get jokes about it. if you dig a deep enough hole you'll end up in China. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, 24 hours to write it. Um, we're not going to be like 
we're not we're not going to be doing any of the online proctoring. Um, you know the I don't know. Maybe some of your courses have um, started. You know, maybe some of your courses have been using online proctor proctoring. Um, personally, I just think it's not a great solution, especially given the international nature of the people taking the course. Um, essentially, what online online proctoring is is you have like a TA or something watching your video feed to make sure you're not checking your phone or something, which, you know, I don't know. It's a take-home test. It's a take-home exam. We'll think of it that way. So, um, aids are allowed. So if you want to look something up in the Python documentation, you're free to do so. Um, just don't communicate with your other, uh, with your, uh, other people writing the exam, please. Um, that's something that we're going to be checking for after the fact. We're, uh, just like everything else, we're going to run things through our automated plagiarism detection software. So, don't cheat. If you cheat, we'll catch you. Um, but yeah. So, no, you do not have 2.5 hours. I had to select something for the registrar to schedule us for a day. Right? So, I had to select, um... And, like, 2.5 hours is, like, the maximum time slot uh, with respect to the registrar. So I had to I had to uh, sign up for that time slot, or I had to sign up for a time slot. It, the way that it goes is it's like, I want an exam that's this long. And they're like, okay, here's a time. You get no say in it. And I'm like, okay. And that's, that's how picking an exam time slot works. Um, so, yeah, the day is the day. Uh, we'll... Just like the rest of it, we'll start at 9 a.m. and end on 9 a.m. the next day. Um, at least with respect to Eastern Standard Time. So, um, yeah. Anyway, it's just like the test. Just like the test. Um, SQL is going to be in the exam. It could be in the exam. It's a thing that could be in the exam. SQL, I, if... If I were, like, prioritizing my studying, I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about SQL since it's an open book exam and you have access to the lecture slides, uh, which means that, you know, all of the SQL commands you could use, you can look up and just, you know, insert. Can you know how many questions are on the exam? Nope. <laughs> Fun fact, if you dig through the earth from Hamilton, you'll just end up on the, on the uh, coast of Western Australia. Ah, there you go. Western Australia, yeah. Yeah, I suppose because um, you have to take into account not only um, the East-West uh, Hemisphere thing, but also the um, North-South Hemisphere thing. Do we still have full access to Piazza during the exam? So uh, Piazza will be conducted under, uh, under testing rules. So there are, there are some restrictions on what you can do on Piazza. Number one... Do not post any of your code to Piazza unless you do so in the form of a private message, which is only viewable by me and the TAs, okay? Uh, any sharing of code via Piazza will be taken as an attempt at dis academic dishonesty, so don't do it. Uh, you're welcome to ask, you know, sort of clarification questions. So Piazza, to me... The function of Piazza during the exam is, like, in an ordinary test scenario, you, your test writing would be supervised, right, by myself or the TAs or both. And if you had a question about the test, you needed clarification on something, you would put your hand up in the, in the testing hall and, you know, one of the TAs or me would come over to you and say, yes, what is your question? And you would whisper, I don't know what question four is asking. And then we would say, well, we can't, uh, we can't, uh, we can't tell you what the question means because interpreting the question is part of the test. However, we can read it to you again while waggling our eyebrows. Um, that's, um, you know, that's, you know. So, to me, the best, uh, the best replacement for that type of thing is um, 
using the Piazza Forum to ask those types of clarification questions. Typically, you know, in a real testing environment, I know you guys, like, you guys are an interesting group because a lot of you have never written an exam in a university environment before. So, um, you know, it's going to be a bit of a shock next year, to be honest with you. But, um, <clears throat> so, with the... Um, when a when a question is asked about clarifying something and it's actually a point that needs clarification to the whole class typically there would be an announcement or something in the testing hall it's like uh, yes on page four of the uh, uh, mechanical engineering 43 x3 course uh, on page seven question four it's meant to say false not true for selection three Something like that, you know. Um, so I see Piazza as being a replacement for that. Um, yep. So, again, just keep in mind that this is testing circumstances. So please don't share your actual code or solutions. Um, but, yeah, uh, if you absolutely have to do so, do it in the form of a private message, which is only viewable by me or the TAs. I'm going to be personally attending to the Piazza Forum on the day of the exam. Um, because, like, four of the other TAs have uh, exams on that day, and I need to see if I can rope uh, one or two of the other ones into helping me out with it. But yeah! There we go. Okay. Um, if you were to suggest, where should you prioritize studying? What topics should they be? Um, so this is typically the type of thing that I talk about on during the review session, but, you know, the review session is the day before the test, so, uh, the day before the exam. So I guess I can give you guys some hints. Um, you need to be comfortable using two-dimensional lists. Like, if you're not comfortable using two-dimensional lists, you're not going to have a very fun time. Um, obviously, there's going to be a thing about recursion. Obviously, there's going to be a thing about um, classes. You know, those are sort of major testable subjects. Um, would be good to know floating point. You know, how to use floating point correctly, how to get around the fact that floating point is a little terrible and sometimes gives bad results. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, the uh, the things in the in the course. Oh, like you need to know how to use exceptions, obviously, but that's not too difficult, right? Um, the only things that I will commit to not being on the exam are the stuff on graphing and visualization, because it's just a bitch to test. Pardon my French. Um, and um, machine learning is also not... I'm, I'm committing to machine learning not being on the test either. Will there be a bonus question? Um... So I'm not sure if I'm going to do a bonus question or just, like, take the total denom... Like, just lower the denominator, like, by however many points ahead of time. I'm not sure it's going to break into, like, a nice ch Like, a snack-sized bonus. Like, the thing about bonus questions is, like, I always have to manage what the maximum possible percentage on the, on the evaluation is. And I'm not sure that there's going to be a single question that's going to hit that percentage exactly so that I can put it at the end of the exam um, but uh, and call it a bonus question. So we'll see. There will be bonus marks available. There will be bonus marks available. But, um, you know, in some sense, it doesn't really matter that there will be bonus marks available. They're only applicable to the exam itself. It's like uh, they don't overflow the category, right? But... Uh, yeah. When does overflow and underflow occur in Python? Um, so, 
So, um, not much. So the thing about overflow and underflow, uh, these are concepts related to um, integers. You have a certain number of bits that hold an integer, typically in a programming language, and when your um, when your integer is increased by, uh, like, if your integer becomes larger through some op like an addition operation, if it becomes larger than the amount than the memory it has assigned to it can hold, you end up in a situation called overflow. Um, so, it's kind of it's, um, I'm going to explain it in terms of Pokemon get, uh, Pokemon, uh, glitches. So, everybody knows the missing no glitch. Uh, there was a, there was another thing you could do surfing on that one side of Cinnabar Island. You could catch a Pokemon that was over a level, lo, over level 100. If that Pokemon ever gained any experience points, it would reset to level 0, um, but, uh, or level 1. But you could use rare candy on that Pokemon to increase its level to 255, <clears throat> at which point it would reset to zero. So at that point, um, uh, the Pokemon's level would be zero because you added one to the maximum stored number, which was eight bits. Um, so yeah, that's overflow. Does it occur in Python? Not really. Python has a lot of mechanisms that occur in the background to catch overflow before it happens and assign more... Uh, space to your integers before uh, you enter an overflow situation. So, um, and underflow works the same way. So, you don't have to worry about it in Python, but you do have to worry about it in C. Um, I'm not telling you what it's out of. Har, har, har. Uh, what percentage of the course evaluations have been submitted so far? I don't know. I haven't, uh, I haven't checked my email this morning, to be honest with you, and probably by the end of today I'll know, and I'll post it as an announcement. Can I give a, an example of a two-dimensional list in Python? Um, how about we save that for the review session? Um, oh, with regards to floating point numbers. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's something you can Google, probably. <clears throat> um... Can I give an example of a two-dimensional two list? Um, yeah, okay, what the heck. Um, so, a list is, um, you know, one, two, three, right? A two-dimensional list is a list of lists. Alright? A list of lists. So the thing about lists of lists is that they have two um, they have two uh, indexes, right? The first index is actually the row that you want. Like, if you arranged these, um, if you arrange these in a, um, there. If you arrange these in a pattern like this, you can sort of put them like this, and you can see how this is a matrix, right? Just like from linear algebra. So the, the trick, however, uh, is that the first index is the row that you want, and the second one is the, is the column, essentially. So if you want to access uh, the columns, you have to loop over all of the rows and accumulate a new, uh, a new list of all of the things in a, in a particular position within the rows. But if you wanted, like, uh, 1, 0, you know, that would be 4 because it's row 1 element 0 right so this so in this case it's kind of like it's like xy coordinates but y comes first so that's that's a two dimensional list was thursday's lecture posted somewhere i think that i um 
I, I, I believe I made the accidental mistake of forgetting to make the video uh, public. I think it was still unlisted. I actually went through a bunch of my old videos immediately before this lecture and put them all, put them all to uh, public. So hopefully you'll be able to find all of those. Um, for any of the lectures that we occurred, that, that, that we did on, um, oh, frick. Um, for any of the lectures that we did on Teams, those will be on Teams. Teams has been storing them. Um, uh, yes. So, there you go. Um, will there be any questions as hard as uh, question two on, on test three? Um, I think uh, the difficulty on uh, question two um, may have been related to um, inadequately elaborated test cases and inadequately um, put together testing files and things of that nature which had to be fixed in post. We are aiming for the difficulty of the exam related to uh, inappropriate test cases to be zero. You know, um, that being said, uh, it's kind of interesting because when we are talking about um, exams in the uh, in the sense that we're delivering them, or assignments in the sense that we're delivering them, we really are creating a software product for you guys. You know, like we are writing software that is the assignment essentially, and um, like the primary component of what goes into those is code, not you know written descriptions of questions. So, because code is fallible. It is always possible that um, our code might have some issues with them. Hopefully those issue issues are relatively minor, but it's kind of almost impossible to catch them all uh, beforehand, unfortunately. Uh, as, you, as you continue on in your software journey, you will probably begin to have some appreciation of the fact that it's, impo it's almost impossible to get uh, software working completely flawlessly. Um, so, yeah. Will there be any questions as hard as uh, question two? Um, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. YouTube is not enough receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. I hope that you guys are hearing all of this. It seems like it's still working on my end, but... Hmm. Okay. Anyway, um... So, yeah. With respect to two-dimensional coordinates, just um, visualization is not included. Is dates? Um, yeah, date time objects are testable. Yeah, um, date time objects are testable. The only reason that visualization is not testable is because it's like it's almost impossible to get an auto grader to do anything with it. So we'll post if things start to go south. Cool. And I will be, I will be present and accounted for for the duration of the test. So hopefully, if any uh, if any obstacles arise, um, uh, we'll be able to deal with them swiftly, swifter than eagles, stronger than lions, etc., etc. Anyway, um, so yeah, let's uh, let's talk about some machine learning. I will say one more thing about the exam. There is a question that I put together um, yesterday, mostly. Still needs a little bit of work, but, um, you know, it's kind of mostly complete. Um, and I think you guys will think it's cool. I think it's really cool. Um, one of the TAs was like, wow, that's a cool question, and then immediately attributed it to one of the other TAs. Uh, rather than me. <laughs> That's okay. 
So where were we? I think we were talking, we did Minkowski different distance, I think. Um, I don't think we did this bit, though. Okay. So, we were talking about machine learning. Let me just see, before we get into it, if there are any questions that have come up. Nope. Okay. So, we were talking about machine learning, and we were talking about classification. So, if you have a bunch of things that have a bunch of features, you can organize those features into what are called feature vectors. Uh, feature vectors are just, you know, they're vectors that contain, you know, numerical representations of the things that were in, you know, the feature matrix. Because they're now numerical, we can perform math over them. And one of the things that we need to be able to do if we're going to uh, perform things like clustering analysis or regression analysis is we need to be able to determine the distance between two points in one of these um, feature vector spaces. So um, the, the, the thing about it though is that you're not necessarily looking for Euclidean distance. Uh, we're looking in this case for what's called taxicab distance. Toodle doodle boodle. Test. Test, 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 test. T -t 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 test, test. Test, 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 test. Ta da ta da ta test. Test. Looks like we're okay. Hello? Hello? I'm going to wait until I can hear myself speaking. dropping frames. This is good. All right. I think we're back. <clears throat> so anyway, the Minkowski distance. <coughs> um, so in general, these, th uh, the red, the blue, and the yellow lines here are all shortest paths from A to B using taxicab metric. Um, I'm not going to bother having you guys, you know, answer the question, that what's the distance between these? It's 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There you go. Um, yes. What about the Euclidean distance? It's 5, because uh, 9 plus 16 is 25, square root, that's 5. Bam. We have a function for calculating the Minkowski distance, um, which again, so, oh, oh, geez, I hate it when I do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go through this and without doing the examples because, you know, it's not going to be on the exam and we couldn't, you know, it would be cool to get to the sentiment analysis stuff. So, <clears throat> uh, 
Um, with respect to our previous example of moderate modeling the similarity of animals, trying to determine whether or not something is a reptile, uh, the other thing that we can do is we can create a class for animals. This will be initialized with uh, a, an animal name and a set of features. Uh, the name itself and the feature set are both saved as attributes of the class. And we can define the distance between this and another animal as being the Minkowski distance between the two feature vectors. So, <clears throat> if we define a bunch of animals as, um, you know, instance objects of the animal class, pardon me for a second. <coughs> expressed in snake language, by which I mean python. You know, we've got cobra, rattlesnake, boa, alligator, dart frog, salmon, python. Uh, our animals is a list of uh, these objects. Uh, they correspond to this data here. So you can see, um, for example, dart frog is true, true, uh, sorry, true, false, true, false, four, one, zero, one, zero, four. I said in the previous lecture, that um, because this numeric data is not normalized for its maximum value, the number of legs will be four times as potent as determining whether or not something is or is not a reptile as, um, as any other one feature. So my recommendation to you is if you are doing this type of machine learning um, uh, in the future, you get to decide what the weighting of the categories is, right? <clears throat> but in order to decide the weighting of the categories, you need to first normalize all of the categories so that they all have the same weight. Um, yeah. Because remember, machine learning is just statistical analysis. So, if we want to generate a matrix, this is so tiny, but I'm going to see if I can blow it up for you guys. Um, if we want to generate a matrix of the Minkowski difference distances between each of these different types of animals, um, you can see that cobras and rattlesnakes are the same thing. Um, dart frogs are significantly different from cobras, rattlesnakes, and boa constrictors, salmon, and pythons, but, you know, not as dissimilar to alligators. Uh, alligators are kind of the same. Um, so you can, you know, you can calculate, generate all of the Minkowski distances. Boom, boom, boom. Doop -a -doop. Quantum interference. I think maybe it's, um, karma. <laughs> it's just bad karma. Uh, so let's talk about re linear regression. Regression is a variety of hmm. sorry okay i guess there sorry guys i just had like a, a um a, a strange truck pull into my driveway and then leave um i think they had the wrong address anyway are we still, oh my gosh, no. Um, still there, still there, okay. So, regression analysis is likely a thing that you did back in high school. Um, it's a type, you can teach a computer to do this. It's a type of supervised learning. In regression, output values are continuous. For example, real numbers rather than discrete uh, with the feature vectors that we were talking about. Our goal is to come up with a rule that predicts the output values based on the values in the training data. So, <clears throat> um, whereas in regular statistics, you would have called the data set on which you're operating the, you know, the data set, or, you know, well, yeah. Uh, in this, we're calling it training data. So the point is you have this cluster and you want to generate a regression line for the data. 
Suppose we have n two-dimensional data points. We want to find a function f that predicts y from x. In linear regression, we are trying to find a line equation that approximately fits the data y is equal to cx plus b, or mx plus b, whichever you like. c is the coefficient, and b is the intercept. Our procedure is as follows. Number one, obtain the data. Number two, divide the data into two sets, the training set and the testing set. So this is where a difference between uh, your standard statistical analysis and um, machine learning comes in. Uh, in regular statistical, statistical analysis, you perform your regression over the entire data set. In this case, we're dividing it in two so that we can use half of that data to test the accuracy of the prediction generated by the other half of the data. So, run linear regression on the training data to get the proposed coefficient and intercept. Use the proposed coefficient and intercept to predict the y value of the testing data from its x values. Measure how far the predicted y values are from the real y values in the testing data set. Measuring how far the predicted y values are from the real y values. So this is not something we've talked about. Um, generally speaking, the method used is mean squared error. So uh, if y, uh, if lowercase y1 to yn are the real y values and capital Y1 through yn are the predicted values as generated by the linear regression model, um, the error of the sample i is y minus y. The squared error is y minus y squared, and the mean squared error is the average of all of these errors. So um, the summation from i equals 1 to n of y to the uh, y sub i minus capital Y sub i squared divided by n, uh, you know, the average. <clears throat> so why do we use squared why do we why are we concerned about the mean squared error well it because it disproportionately shows you uh outliers so <clears throat> because we're squaring the error the larger the error is the like the um the mean squared error error scales non-linearly with the um with the actual raw error, right? So the further something aw is away, the more it contributes to the um, sort of measure of the badness of the fit, right? Uh, so, and again, because we're taking the average, one isn't, like one value that's super far away is not gonna throw off the average too much. But if you have like a whole bunch of points that have really big errors, then that indicates that probably your, your model isn't a very good one. So, linear regression tries to find proposed coefficients and intercepts that minimize the mean squared error. This is called least squares estimation. The coefficient of determination, aka the R squared score, is a measure of the goodness of fit of the regression model. R squared equals 1 implies a perfect fit, and R squared equals 0 implies no better fit than a horizontal line. We will use scikit-learn for linear regression and other machine learning in Python. You can have it if uh, you can have you have scikit-learn if you have an Anaconda distribution installed. It's also on JHub 2. Uh, that's not what we call JHub anymore. It's JHub. 1MD3, ha <laughs> um, to install on a local computer for use on idle slash Jupyter, try one of the following, etc., etc. This is how to install it. Oh, I hate when I do that. So, linear progression re... re uh, blah. Linear regression procedure, not the li linear progression procedure. Um... Just to remind you, remind you guys, we're going to obtain the data, divide the data, regress on the training data, um, predict the testing data, and then measure how far away the predicted test data is from the actual test data.
So, number one, obtaining the source. We need a list of x and y points. In this particular case, we're going to generate them randomly. So, um, generate sample data with, uh, so it takes a certain co coefficient in. Um, so, basically, what's going into the generation of our random data is a linear model, right? So, we're giving it a line, and we're saying, okay, generate random points around this line um, with a certain uh, spread to them and a certain number of samples. And we basically what we're seeing is how well our regression is going to be able to capture the original coefficient that was used to generate the testing data, or generate the data points, period. So there you go. We then divide the data into the training and testing uh, things. So when you're dividing this data, you don't necessarily want to just take the first half and take the second half and just split it down the middle. <clears throat> the problem with doing that is that you may run into a situation where the first part of your testing data has some sort of bias uh, and the second part of it has another bias. Uh, if you want a good model, you have to try to equalize biases that might occur positionally within the data that you're trying to do, or that you're trying to process. Um, this isn't so much of an issue with the data that we're currently talking about, because it's being generated via pseudo-random numbers, and highly unlikely that it would have any bias in the first half. Um, however, if this is data that's being taken by humans, like, for example, um, a good example is um, stopwatch. Um, stopwatch trials, right? So for any human observer that's measuring anything with a stopwatch trial, um, the human being gets better at stopping the stopwatch uh, when the phenomenon they're observing has terminated as they do that, right? They get better with practice. Even over the course of like 10 trials, by the 10th trial, you'll be much better at stopping the stopwatch than you were at the, uh, you know, on the first and second trial. So, um, you know, you have two approaches to solving that problem. You can throw out the first few uh, tests on the, uh, on the assumption that, you know, you weren't quite into your rhythm with the stopwatch, which would probably be a decent approach. The other thing that you can do is you can ran, you can, you know, just have that, um, you can have that accounted for in the statistical model by just, you know, sort of randomizing the data, you know. But you can see if you were taking stopwatch data, 10 trials, and the first five you used to generate your model and the second five you used to test your model, it would come out that your model wasn't very good because the first five trials you were, do you were clicking by hand and you were a bit slower because you, you weren't as practiced at it. Um, so that would be a bias in the first data set. Um, so... Ideally, uh, and the other thing is, you don't want to do, you know, uh, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two with all your data either, because um, then if there's some bias that's occurring with every other trial, then that will bias your data as well. What you want to do is you want to randomly select with a probability of 50% whether a particular piece of data goes in the testing set or the training set. Uh, that way, no... Um, because you're adding a, another layer of randomization, um, you are tr you're trying to randomize out any biases that might be in your data set. Um, yep. Let's see if there are any questions. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm actually not familiar with the least squares method in linear algebra, but um, it's, you know, math does apply itself across different domains in math. So, the randomly generated data uh, in Python is then split into training data and testing data. So we generate the sample data, and then we split the testing data, and we give it data train and data test. We then print those off. Huzzah! If we want to plot the training data, we can uh, use the following. You can see this is an example of what you might generate. We can then use scikit-learn to perform the linear regression. So from sklearn import linear model, rigor is an object of the 
it's a it's an object of the class linear regression linear model dot linear regression x train is equal to fix 1d array x train um, that's again um, I think that's from is that from earlier I'm not sure anyway regression dot fit x train y train Yeah. Oh, the function's on the next slide. Yeah, okay. There's the function. It's on the next slide. Um, and then we can print our estimated coefficient and estimated intercept. Um, Scikit-learn expects we are doing complicated data sets in high dimensions. Unfortunately, we have to do an extra step to convert back to a basic 2D regression using the following function. There you go. All right, so that's uh, it's 10.20. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, please let me know, and uh, we shall have those questions answered. Um, otherwise, I'll let you guys get to your next class. God, I'm loud. Jeez. What is the best way to cl practice classes? Um, hmm. Well, um, probably if you go to like Code Academy or something, there would be a lot of exercises on classes in Python. Google. Python classes. I don't know if you have to pay for code class, code academy, but if you're looking for some extra practice material on classes, Maybe they want money for it now. Um, for kids? Yeah. Okay. These might be some for you. Uh, W3resource.com slash Python exercises slash class exercises. Um, generally speaking, I find uh, W3 resources to be okay. Not terrible. Will I have a graduate seminar or defense probably next semester? Um, it's been a bit, it's been one of those semesters, you know? Um, do I know any exceptional books on C or C++ that I would recommend? <sighs> no.
No. <laughs> no, I don't. Um. You know, the dummies books are usually pretty good, actually. But, uh, no, unfortunately, I don't. Um. I can tell you the one that I use for the class. I'm. I don't think it's exceptional. I don't think I would. Yeah, like, I don't know if I would recommend it to anybody who's, like, not taking a course in conjunction with the book. But uh, this is the book that I've been using for um, for 2MP3, uh, see how to program 8th edition, even though there is a 10th ex edition that exists. This is, like, an edition of the book that included C++ uh, in it a bit. So that's, you know, it's, it, you got to cover it, so, yeah. Um... Yeah. Gosh, that truck is back. My goodness. Um, yeah, anyway, I think I'm gonna... I think I'm gonna log off here so I can see what those people in the 